Next speaker is uh, also a friend of mine, I would say. I've known her for many, many years. Uh, first as a competitor, she was barista at Java in, uh, in, in Mocha in Oslo. Uh, then she moved on to working a little bit higher up in that system and then moved to uh, the US and uh, worked for a roastery there, Ritual was it? Then 49 Parallel, Green Buyer. Then moved to Kenya, working for Dormans, the exporter, and now working in Geneva. Okay. Yeah, in Switzerland or? Yep. Yeah, Geneva is in Switzerland. For uh, Sukatina. <laughs> so I'll just help you with the presentation. Oh, was the right one? Sorry. I was just reading it. I wasn't even near Sorry, Jeff. <laughs> So, without further ado, uh, Mette Marie Hansen, or Mia as we know her, uh, give her a big hand. This is good. This is number one. There we go. So, um, yeah, I um, work with a company called Sukafina. Um, I joined this year um, at the end of June after spending the last almost four years in Kenya exporting coffee. And so um, I was actually asked to speak about Kenya and, and the role of the exporters, so that's where I'll uh, focus. Um, thank you for spending so much time on Kenya on this uh, program. It's a great opportunity for all the producers in Kenya to, uh, to be exposed to hopefully new buyers. Um, also thanks Joanne for uh, enlightening me on the, on the various types of buyers. I think uh, for Kenya, a lot of the time, I think we need the purists, was that it? That's sort of very strictly focused on the top quality. Um, and and that, is, uh, that is great. With Sukafina, we have a slightly different approach. Um, I traveled yesterday from, uh, from Kenya um, and was spent most of my day on planes. Um, and I was looking over my presentation. And when I'm on planes, I get kind of crazy. I just like, I feel very emotional. I feel like I cry to stupid movies, and I looked at my presentation. I thought this was too many facts, so so I put in a little bit of sort of the bigger picture and how we also work with farmers on the ground. But um, I remember when I started as a buyer or even as a barista, trying to sort of wrap my head around the supply chain in Kenya was was fairly uh, was fairly complicated. And so I'm going to do like a lot of facts in the next half an hour, um, and then Charles will repeat some of it, and then he will sort of give the more flowery stories. And then we'll have this panel discussion where we'll all uh, kind of talk together about uh, everything. Um, of course, what an exporter is doing all the time is sort of wrangling all these relationships with growers, with importers, with roasters. We're trying to find the best price. We're trying to um, make the most value for the for the growers. Uh, and so a lot of what we deal with, uh, because we need to put out a lot of money to do this, to sort of bankroll this whole a year of production cycle, uh, so most of what we deal with is actually finance, which is also my background. I went to business school with uh, Tim, probably had my worst exam with the group, uh, a joint venture on a <laughs> collaboration, but uh, otherwise I did pass my degree. Um, and, uh, and one of my favorite quotes, uh, speaking about uh, coffee and, and a lot of what we deal with as coffee traders is, is you know, um, finance, finance and financing growers and, and futures. And so I really, really like this quote. Um, the essence of finance is time travel. Saving is about moving resources from the present into the future. Financing is about moving resources from the future back into the past. Stock prices reflect cash flows into an infinite future. A long-term interest rate contains within it predictions about a whole series of future short-term interest rates. Markets are constantly predicting future actions, and as those actions move closer in time, the predictions become more solid and precise. One of my favorite quotes, and, and it's actually what all the, all the exporters are doing, it is dealing with financing, and also importers have to deal a lot with financing. And I'm sure also small roasters have to really plan their sort of, um, your cash flow. Um, I met some people that's been in this industry for probably almost 20 years, as, as I have, and then I've also met people here that's been in coffee for a month. Um, and let me tell you, it's a very cash-intensive business to be in. Let me talk a little bit about the Kenya supply chain. You see how easy it is? Um, I broke it down into sort of the financial needs. Uh, this is the supply chain that was actually going on. And these are the players um, we're talking about at the various steps. So um, 
the first thing that happens is that either you have to plant coffee or you have mature coffee. For this, you need to uh, have access to inputs or working capital. And a lot of this is what the exporter is dealing with. Um, who, who has some coffee is the growers, uh, who has the inputs, input suppliers, and of course then is, is the exporters. Or, or in Kenya, a lot of the exporters are actually also involved with a, with a sort of second kind of operation, which is called the marketing agent. Uh, then uh, we'll start the harvesting and primary processing, which is the pulping, which is what's happening at these um, factories, as we call them in Kenya, that John is showing a picture of. Uh, for that, we need uh, advance payments um, to finance the cherry and parchment advance. Um, of course, there is also a lot of maintenance of machinery um, and risk management tools. So. For growers in Kenya, a lot of the exporters are also offering to hedge their crop, to um, buy forex. Um, so whatever needs they have is is, um, is often supported by the by the exporters. Um, then, after it's been processed, um, it's it's moved to the uh, cooperative or or factory. Uh, so call them then. Uh, so I couldn't fit everything on one slide, so this is kind of the continuation of the first slide. Huh? Uh, so there it's sitting at the factory of cooperative for about, um, I don't know, a few weeks, and it's moved to, to mill or commercial warehouse. Uh, it's kind of the same financial needs uh, here. You need the uh, machinery and then the working capital because the coffee is still kind of moving around. Um, and then once it's been milled, the marketing agent prepares the coffee for sale. Um, Klaus is also going to touch, uh, touch this a little bit in his presentation, but basically this is what most roasters are concerned about. There are two ways um, to sell your coffee in Kenya if you are a grower. You can either sell it uh, direct or you can sell it through the auction. Um, the auction is a perfect uh, system for price discovery for farmers. So there is nothing um, like in Ethiopia where you just buy a commodity. In, in Kenya there are literally hundreds of coffees every week being sold under the grower's name. Um, the volume uh, that is being offered, and then everyone sees who is the buyer, and then of course they're fetching in it. So you can't see during the bidding who's, who you're bidding against, but you can see exactly what coffee you're buying, um, which is great. Um, but it takes a little bit more time in terms of the financial transactions. So between sort of the milling and the marketing agent putting this coffee in the auction, there is always a few weeks where you submit all the samples to the auction, um, which has to be done 10 days before the actual auction date. And after buying in the auction, all the dealers, all the exporters or whoever has a license to buy in the auction has another two weeks of, of making the payment. And then a lot of the time also the, the cooperatives uh, will wait paying the farmers until the season is finished, until they close sort of all their business. Uh, of course, with a, with a direct um, way of, of selling this coffee, you find the buyer overseas for the coffee, and instead of submitting it to the auction, it is sold um, to a buyer overseas. It, it can't be a local company doing this, it has to be you know, a contract between... Um, uh, where are you buying coffee from? Uh, Kangocho and then yeah? Um So that's how it works. And, and, and it means that the financial um, delay is also much shorter. So it, and the other thing is, in Kenya, growers are um, getting older, and they have a lot of experience in coffee. So um, if you want to do the direct purchase, you really have to pay up for it. Uh, it's how growers typically purchase the highest premiums. Um, so when I used to um, work as an exporter in Kenya, if you want to buy direct, we always did it the day after the auction, so that uh, we could offer a premium to the price paid for a similar quality in the previous day's auction. So you always have to up your game a little bit if you want to buy coffee directly. Of course, the benefit for the grower is that they're getting paid more, but also hopefully that they can, can connect with um, a buyer. So what else is the, is the exporter doing? To, to look at the very sort of strict facts, um, for the farmer, uh, of course, we offer finance and risk management tools. I already touched that a little bit. Um, we also always try to find them the very best price. Um, a lot of the work we do um, as exporters has to do with the uh, price and quality risks. We always try to fetch the best price. Um, we always try to find buyers who's willing to pay up for the coffee. Um, and we always try to manage the quality risk uh, for them. So try to um, 
really pay up for the coffee if you think it's worth it, or, or you know, uh, find the purpose uh, for it uh, either way. Of course, uh, part of uh, the job is to give market access, so finding nice buyers overseas. A lot of the expertise is uh, the processing, uh, the blending, the bulking, because not all coffee is top quality coffee, but all coffee has a home. Um, and then it's the part that I sort of been, uh, become a specialist in, which is um, uh, the economy of scale in, uh, in consolidating consignments from different farmers or different buyers and sort of sending them in one container overseas because you have one roaster who wants to buy 20 bags of this, another one buying 50 bags of this, and then you have another 100 here and then 10 here, and all together it becomes a container, but uh, it's quite a tedious work. And, and then it's the logistics, of course. And, and before kind of any of the coffee offering uh, starts, in, in, I mean, in practice, you already paid up for the coffee uh, before you even start offering it as an exporter. Um, it's kind of exactly the same for the roaster uh, or the importer. Uh, we also try to be sort of the middle man, which is what we're often called anyways, um, to find, find the roaster the best deal, the best value. Uh, and we try to manage as best we can the, the quality risk, uh, not uh, you know ship the coffee, that's not good. Uh, give them access to the growers. Um, also use our expertise in sort of getting all the coffee um, uh, expertly bulked, um, blended, doing a really nice milling. Um, and then same, uh, consolidating containers for uh, the buyers and then logistics. So it's pretty much all the same. Uh, then, of course, we also have the public sector, which uh, Joanne briefly touched and that Klaus will speak a little bit more about. Uh, but there's always a lot of legal framework, um, national policies, rules and regulations that you're sort of, you have your finger on the pulse on um, what's going on in the country. Um, especially at Sukafino, maybe, um, we did a fair amount with um, e Commodore and CMS as well, but it's the research, the extension work that you do in the fields, all the farmer training, that you're sort of taking uh, off the hands of, of you know, the public. Uh, the, you know, in Kenya, there is uh, all growers that's exporting coffee has to pay a levy, uh, that's for the Coffee Research Foundation, which is supposed to do all this outreach work, but uh, Kenya being where it is, uh, nothing is happening, and so, so there is an opportunity there for the, for the exporters to really uh, push for this to happen and use their own resources for it. Uh, also, access to inputs. I know we're going to have someone speaking about inputs, but I'm going to touch it a little bit still. Um, I'll get back to that in a bit. Uh, microfinancing. So um, right now, especially in Kenya, with uh, some, some changes in the rules, there's a lot of discussion from the public about how to finance farmers, the truth is that private exporters and marketing agents are already spending millions of dollars every year pre-financing farmers, helping with equipment, um, and then corporate governance trying to really um, encourage good corporate governance on the cooperative um, level, uh, which, is a, which is a big challenge um, in, in Kenya, in East Africa in general, um, I'm sure. Uh, maybe you have heard that uh, corruption is fairly rampant, um, which makes it very difficult to, to navigate these origins. All right. Um, so what are these uh, farmers that we are working with and what are their constraints and why do they need um, the exporters? Um, of course, there is a lack of technical business and financial support. Um, they often lack um, information about markets, the international uh, coffee market, and, and what you do as an exporter is that you work a lot towards the market. Uh, specialty coffee is most often sold outright, so you uh, you know buy it, buy it at the price and you sell it outright at the price with a markup. That's always very transparent because otherwise uh, uh, roasters would probably not favor you. Um, but um, you know every week we have the auction and every week prices change a little bit. How most commercial coffee is sold is that it's sold differentially. So you buy a coffee at, uh, buy an AB at, so now the market is 160, so you buy it at uh, 250, so you buy it at 90 over. Um, but of course, if the market was 200 and you buy it at 90 over, then you're paying 290. Um, and to sort of uh, inform growers and sort of explain this is, is quite a task. Um, then, um, of course, 
a lot of farmers are also stuck in this uh, politics that we, Joanne talked about it, I'm mentioning it, and Pat's been speaking more about it. Um, a lot of farmers, younger people, are moving to cities. And farmers are um, getting older. Um, we haven't really seen a change in, in generation in cotton farming in Kenya. Um, at least the, it's coming now, but it's difficult to entice young people to stay in farming when land is becoming smaller um, and there isn't much money in it compared to living in Nairobi and, you know, working in a house or going to school. Um, all right. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how we work at Sukapino and how I think um, that we can kind of make this uh, complicated uh, Kenyan supply chain a little bit easier for roasters to understand and work with. Um, so I one time had a very um, strictly commercial buyer. Because I said all coffee has a home, and a lot of the coffee that you deal with, even in a country like Kenya, doesn't really even look like coffee. You look at this, and it's all kind of rubbish. And so he wanted to buy it at a very low price, um, probably, I think, 30 cents under market, which isn't really an even production price in Kenya. Um, but he wanted to buy it with a story. He said, can you make up a story? And I thought, what sort of story can I make up? I mean, this coffee is probably produced by people that are so poor that, uh, you know, they just pick up whatever they can find on the ground and deliver it to, to coffee and, you know, they probably paid almost nothing and now you want to negotiate on the price and you want the story. Um, and I thought that was, it, it really kind of upset me, uh, but it also intrigued me a, a little bit uh, because the truth is that most coffee producers are very poor. Uh, most coffee producers in South Africa are very poor. They live in economies that's been stagnant for the last 40 years. I think Joanne said that production has been declining for 43 years. Um, I don't have the production numbers, but at least the economy has not really developed in the last 43 years. If you go to Kenya and you speak to small estate owners, they, um, you know, they're in their, there is a little bit of a generation change, but let's say that they're in their 60s or 70s or 80s. They sent their kids through school. They sent them to university on coffee money. You can't do that anymore. Um, and truth is that, you know, we left globally about a billion humans behind this development has happened in our part of the world. Um, but there is something uh, good about that as well, because of this one billion, the majority is farmers. You know, they're all farming, uh, not just coffee, a lot of other things. But I think, uh, I think that's really exciting that you have this, uh, this huge amount of farmers, and, and you can do very small things to sort of lift them out of poverty. They have all the same professions. You just really need to find the method, and then you teach uh, everyone, and, and off you go. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so I'm excited uh, that we have this one profession for everyone. Uh, and we have sort of one um, idea to Gafina, like the number one pillar in farmer training, which is to make them more productive. And it is not what specialty coffee likes to hear, but when you make farmers more productive, they earn more income and they climb up the poverty. And I have to mention this. Uh, most of the farmers that I know uh, are women in, in terms of doing the actual farm work. Uh, and, you know, these. She's physically strong, she's very mentally tough, and she will do whatever it takes to give a better life to her children. So I think if you're gonna think that the future of coffee is in like one person's hand, this is, this is her. Um, and of course, like I said, they produce coffee, but it's subsistence farming, so they do many other crops as well. Uh, and there are sort of two ways that we can we can do this. We can make them more productive, or we can sort of eradicate the land uh, with uh, making more farmland, which doesn't really work well in the long run. Um, but also, when I travel around East African origins, I sort of, I, I haven't really thought about this uh, until the last couple of years because it's, it's so much, there's so much going on. But then I started noticing that you know people are using these tools that we used here in the Bronze Age. You know they're tilling the soil with their hands and they have these pungas and you know there isn't really much uh, much uh, that has developed in the last uh, 200 years. Um, 
So we haven't really finished the, the delivery of, of what we know. But the truth is that we have actually solved all these problems uh, for part of the world for more than 100 years. And you know, we sort of rallied away in our development, but we have all the solutions. So these are the three solutions that I think uh, we have in coffee that is uh, eventually going to help all these farmers become healthy. Improved uh, yield and quality is key. Um, I think soil analysis and correct and timely use of the right inputs is key. Um, and then it's the diversification and delivery, um, the social and environmental factors. Um, so let's look at this um, yield and quality. Um, this uh, is a nursery up in Kiambu uh, County at the, at the factory. It's not very well maintained, but it's, it's there. Um, I think um, I think I remember this number. Um, so I heard this guy talking from World Coffee Research a couple of, year, a couple of weeks ago in Geneva. And uh, he was talking about coffee varieties. And, and truth is, there aren't many varieties for growers to choose between. Uh, does anyone know how many varieties we have in coffee? Any guesses? 40? Any other guesses? Oh, that's a very good guess. It's 36, 37. Oh. Um, and how many varieties of watermelon do we have? Anyone remember? Yeah, thousands. Huh? Thousands. It's almost 2,700. And the growers of coffee are left with 36 to choose in between. So we need to create hybrid varieties. Um, we need to give growers some choices. And hybrids are created when you pollinate two plants uh, that are disease resistant or, and it's been done in Kenya, but it's probably not very well. And I think it needs a better sort of global scope. Um, it's a really good web page called worldcoffeeresearch.org that I would recommend for everyone to look at. And I would recommend everyone to donate money. Um, at Zucafina, we're now doing demo plots uh, in East Africa with World Coffee Research. Um, to um, try out different varieties and see how suitable they are, both in terms of uh, crop and development, but also cup quality. And then it's soil analysis and inputs. Um, because conventional fertilizer, if it's used correctly, and you might hear there's just a little pinch of fertilizer on a tree that's bigger than I am, like this guy is holding, you unlock an enormous yield gain. Um, there's a huge opportunity uh, in that. And I know we're going to have a whole talk about that after, so I'm not going to talk about it for a long time. But when you do this and you space out your seeds, um, which is another thing in East Africa, not so much in Kenya, but the spacing uh, in Rwanda and Burundi is very, very tight, which makes coffee trees very susceptible to um, problems like pests and diseases. Um, it creates the ideal conditions for uh, insects. Um, we've had a lot of buyers walking away from Rwanda and Burundi coffee because of the potato cup, um, which has a lot to do with uh, the agricultural practices in those countries. But it is a little bit difficult to kind of explain the economies of this, sort of what are the choices for farmers. So, so if you earn very little, how do you sort of engage someone and, and sort of entice them to pay for inputs and put in more labor? Um, I think we often talk about coffee as this wonderful product and it's like picking this ripe cherry and there are coffee trees and, but coffee's a very forgiving crop. Like I used to have coffee trees in my garden in Kenya and I did not do anything with them. Um, so you plant coffee and out comes coffee. So it is a, it's a good cash crop, even if you don't do anything, even if you're not interested in producing quality coffee, uh, you can still grow a coffee tree. Any one of you can do it. Huh? Um, so overall, these are really good news. We have a lot of uh, things that could solve uh, a lot of problems for coffee farmers in East Africa. And um, of course, we do a lot of farming training at Sikafina, and many other good companies are doing it as well. Um, we just haven't finished delivering this. So I think some of you know these guys, uh, which are up in Kinyaga. These are some other farmers up in Embu. Um, and delivery is really key here. It's not going to be me or any of you or, or any of our agronomists that's going to solve really um, 
all these problems going to be the people that can deliver it to the farmers, um, both in training and also the, the physical delivery. Um, all right. So let me talk a little bit about um, the Sukafina approach in Kenya. Um, as I said, I worked for uh, a few years with an export called Women's. Klaus is going to speak about this a lot. Um, but um, we had all these top coffees, and then um, something happened in politics. We had a revolution in Kenya. Um, a lot of people in politics became also very interested in coffee and sort of probably or maybe uh, well intended felt that the growers, you know, you see all these roasters and they're selling this coffee at, you know, 20 euros a quarter kilo. Uh, but the growers are still just getting paid 50 50 or whatever they were getting paid at the time and they wanted to change that by not taking out the middleman but just kind of dictating who the middleman should be. Um, and I thought it we lost some business. Uh, I think the silver lining is that we found a lot of other producers that were also really able and, and keen. Um, but anyways, it's something that I talked a lot about. Um, and then coffee sort of came back. Um, growers could again choose who they wanted to market coffee with. But by then, corruption was pretty rampant. And so what I would want to do if I was to try again, and now I get to try again, is to encourage and support individual growers that produce top quality coffee. Um, this is possible because we had this task force committee, Joanne kind of touched it briefly, um, and they didn't really engage anyone. So, okay, we had all these problems with the coffee, the coffee became very political. Then the, the president uh, decided we need a task force committee that looks at this and figures out how we're going to make farmers more wealthy again. But they didn't really take anyone from coffee, they sort of took it from other industries and, and there are some very uh, extensive suggestions on how to change everything in Kenya. Um, and so uh, one of the good things that happened was that they will allow more individual growers to sell their coffee. Um, and they can do that because you need a grower's license in Kenya, because you need licenses for a lot of these things. Uh, but now the, the aerial, the, the size of your farm has, can be now a little bit smaller for you to be given this license. Um, we use lead farmers, so we use people that are uh, fairly well known in their communities um, to sort of entice other farmers to start doing their own single farmer production. Uh, we cluster them by area so that we can provide all the training. Um, we are already started to train farmers in, in some areas um, and then we don't do anything that's, uh, we don't have any uh, uh, say hard assets in, in that part of the business because we don't know how milling is going to look in a year, but we sort of cooperate with a very nice mill that's set up to deal with these uh, individual farmer lots. So this is sort of how we're doing it. Uh, we have the FAQ quality, and this is what the farmers are presented with as well. So we have the FAQ quality, how 884.4. FAQ is the um, uh, common quality in Kenya. It's like a it uh, stands for fair average quality, which is if you talk to a commercial grower, they want an FAQ or maybe an FAQ plus or an FAQ minus, but uh, um, yeah, that's the quality. Then we have a plus quality, which is slightly better, but still not sold as individual farms, it's bulk and presented, but this is by cluster. So, you know, you may, might have eight or 10 or 20 farmers in, in close proximity to each other that, um, that produces a good cup. Um, then this is where they will end up, and then we have the top lots, which is um, you know paid by roaster choice and sold as an individual farmer lot. Um, Percentage-wise, this is a little bit of a guess because we haven't been through through a full season yet. But uh, I'm anticipating 80% will end up here of the farmers that are chosen to this program. 15% here, and then five hopefully up here. Um, and of course, all these farmers produce tiny volumes, so it's. Uh, pretty nitty gritty, um, but uh, our, our aim is really to, to identify all the growers that can sort of fit this type of program as individual farmers and sort of go around this cooperative structure. And of course, we'll still buy um, nice cooperative coffees through the auction, which has perfect price discovery, but there's no other dealing with, uh, with that. Um, Tim also asked me to uh, 
say something about the, the roaster approach, like how can roasters buy uh, good coffee from Kenya? Um, and I should be pretty good at that, but uh, the first thing roasters ask me is that if I want to buy 10 bags of coffee, how do I do it? And I always say, well, pair up with an importer that can offer the services. Um, I would say that's the first step and find out how they are sourcing and what their plans are for the season. I have lots of nice importers here from 32 cup or 32 cup months, and we have Ankel from Belco, and we have the Nordic approach guys, and maybe there are other here that, that I don't know, but uh, but that's a good uh, good first start and sort of have them connect you with uh, whoever you want to uh, work with. And also, same as for farmers, they can't really wait for their payment until the roaster is ready to take delivery of this coffee in you know, December or January, whenever they start roasting the coffee. Um, most roasters also need a little bit help with financing. Uh, Charles is going to speak a bunch about this, but the best supply chain stories are always about commitment. So stay with your grower. For me, I had never thought about this as Joanne has pointed out, that there are so many different kinds of buyers and so many different kinds of mentalities. But, you know, to change anything, we really need growers to commit to the relationship. It's nice to be cuff driven, but we kind of need a little bit of everything else as well. Otherwise, nothing is going to change. Think of the growers as your partners. And come and visit. All right. So, <laughs> just on time. Uh, I had last slide with questions because I thought it was going to be a bit about, about the human and sorter, but we can really just take a break. Thank you. Thank you. Merci beaucoup.